Good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, depending upon where you're viewing us from. My name is David Rogers, and I welcome you to our Inside a Modern Architecture Fiber Channel, or Inside a Modern Fiber Channel Architecture Talk, here presented by the FCIA. And hopefully everybody can see everything. And Today's speakers will be, I'm David Rogers. Let me start with that. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm David Rogers. I'll be your moderator today. I'm uh, on the FCIA board and uh, work with Teledyne LaCroix developing test tools. Our speakers today will be Ms. Patty Driver, who's the Distinguished Engineer in Storage and Networking Solutions Group uh, at IBM. We have with us also Mr. David Peterson, a Principal Engineer at Broadcom. And last but certainly not least, the colorful and uh, quite active participant, Craig Carlson, active with our uh, FCIA Board of Directors and a senior technologist at Marvell. The, uh, the FCIA, as some of you may know, is the industry organization supporting marketing and, and education for Fiber Channel. It's a uh, nonprofit organization and grouped of uh, manufacturers, integrators, developers, vendors, professionals, and end users who come together with the goal of making certain that we move forward with uh, with fiber channel and keep it uh, keep it alive in the ecosystem. We've been around for 25 years promoting the technology. We uh, have a, a bunch of leading companies. If you'd like more information, there's some text or some uh, links at the end of the pro uh, program which uh, will give you some information more about FCIA. Uh, we'd like to point out that over 140 million fiber channel ports are shipped and in the industry and, and in use today, which we think is a pretty phenomenal number. Our agenda today is uh, an overview of the technology at functional levels. Uh, we'll be talking about FC node architecture and physical models. We have some communication models, interconnect topologies, classes of service, fabric models, and generic services. Uh, we will be taking questions. There'll be a Q&A period at the end of, this, uh, uh, end of this presentation. But if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask them. And uh, my job is to make certain we get those answered for you folks that are viewing us today. And with that, this is uh, slide number uh, five. I, uh, well, actually, I think we're supposed to be, uh, David Peterson is supposed to be talking about this now. So with that, David, uh, sorry for stepping on your slide, but please take over from here. Uh, no problem. All right, howdy everyone. Uh, hope you all having a great day and thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, the agenda there, I'm gonna be doing the overview and Craig is gonna be diving into the functional levels, of the FC node architectural components. And Patty will be doing the physical model, communication models, interconnect topologies, classes of service. Then I'll wrap up with the fabric model and generic services. Uh, so moving on. Fiber channel. It is a bidirectional point-to-point -point serial data communication channel that is architected for high performance. The FC standards actually uh they're developed by the insights t11 technical committee that started way back in 1988 which kind of dates me a little bit and the goal back then was to combine the benefits of scuzzy hippie and escon uh fiber channel may be implemented using a combination of uh three topologies so we've got a point-to-point -point link between two ports then we got a set of ports interconnected by a uh, switching network which we call a fabric and we also have a set of ports interconnected with a loop topology that's the arbitrated loop topology which uh, is no longer in wide use but does still have some uses i, I think in the avionics environment these days all right next slide it's a fiber channel it provides a generic transport for ulps upper level protocols uh, we listed some there, the highlighted ones. We got the single byte common command set, the SBCCS, which is uh, the FICON stuff. And we got our small computer systems interface, the SCSI stuff. That's 
the FCP stuff, then we got NVM Express, and we got FC NVMe, and NVMe2 in that realm, then we can also transport internet protocol. And there's, uh, there's some other UOPs, fringe UOPs that are used too. But the fiber channel protocol provides many implementation possibilities from very low cost to a very high performance. And the transmission medium is isolated from the control protocol, so each implementation can use a technology that is best suited for their environment. Uh, the effective transfer rate achieved by an FC configuration is uh, determined by this set of uh, items. We got the physical variance. Was there our FCPI uh, standard stuff? We got our communication model that we talk about today. We got the payload size. Then we got the speed of the link. Then we got our class of service and then the associated overhead. And with that, I'll hand it over to Craig. Thanks, Dave. So we'll start um, discussing uh, the functional layers. Um, Fiber channel, like many other uh, protocols, is divided into a, a set of uh, levels. Uh, each level is designed to perform a specific set of tasks. So. The first level in fiber channel is FC0 level. Um, this is really the, what's called the physical layer. Um, this contains the actual signaling protocol on the wire, which either be copper or uh, optical cable. It also defined, has the definitions for uh, transmitters and receivers. The next layer, layer is the FC1 layer, which is the transmission protocol, which defines the uh, signaling uh, and bit encoding. Um, which uh, is needed to uh, efficiently uh, transmit across the, the, the wire. Uh, the FC2 layer um, defines the uh, framing layer. And there's the three sub layers for that, which define the actual framing, how it's multiplexed across the fabric, and actually how the, uh, the, the frames are controlled. Then there's the FC3 layer, which is the common services. And if you're at all familiar with Fiber Channel, you probably have heard of the name server, and that's one of the services. As, as, as well as the uh, management server and others. And then there's the FC4 layer where the actual uh, useful work gets done. The FC4 layer maps the upper layer protocols, whether it be uh, um, FICON, single byte command, SCSI, NVMe, uh, TCP IP, uh, and, and others onto the, um, onto the fiber channel uh, protocol. So a little bit more deep dive into these. Uh, so the FC0 layer um, is the actual physical interface that consists of the transmission media, which is the any cabling, transmitters, and receivers. Um, the uh, physical media and, dri and drivers are capable of operating at various speeds. And of course, over the years, we have gone up in speed. Um, and these various speeds are defined in the FCPI set of standards. The FC1 layer um, defines the bit encoding. Now, in order to uh, to transmit the bits on the wire, um, they have to be encoded in some way. Um, and so you have a serial encoder and decoder. You also have error detection at this layer. The uh, transmission code for older or slower speeds up to eight gigabit fiber channel was based on eight, an 8B, 8B, 10B transmission code. Newer, faster speeds um, are based on a 6466 uh, transmission code. Um, and the thing that these codes do is allow the receiver to detect errors and also, in many cases, to fit errors and also, in many cases, to recover um, the bit error so that it actually doesn't result in an, er in an error at, to the upper layers. Especially at higher speeds, this is very important because the higher the speed, the more um, noise can affect uh, um, the signal. The uh, encoding process generates a set of words called transmission words. And each one of these is a block which has that specific um, redundancy built in to allow it to um, cover from errors. And there's also specific encoded bit patterns and referred to as ordered sets. And an example of these would be the R-Ready uh, ordered set, which is used for um, flow control, as well as frame, frame delimiters that indicate start of frame, end of frame, and a bunch of others. 
The FC1 also defines the state machines for um, the behavior of the uh, links for link bring up, bring up um, detection of link failure um, and other things that may happen to a link, um, as well as the speed negotiation function, which uh, determines the operating speed when two ports are, are connected together. So the FC2 layer um, defines the, uh, the framing layer. Um, so frames basically are our fiber channel packets um, of data. And the, uh, the framing layer is defined as, as three sub layers. Um, the FC2P layer um, defines the actual framing and how frames are put together. The FC2M layer defines the, um, the uh, multiplexer, which is the, uh, um, how frames are, are, multiple frames are handled in the framework. And the FC2B layer defines how the frames are grouped together. Um, so that's exchange and sequence management and error recovery. So FC3 um, defines the set of common services that are across the fabric. Many times the FC3 functions are, to, are provided by the fabric. Um, and as I mentioned, this includes the functions such as the name server, management server, and others. And then FC4, which is all where all the work gets done, that defines the mapping from a, a higher level protocol, such as SCSI, uh, SB, SB, CCS, uh, NVMe, TCP, IP, onto Fiber Channel. So how do you how do we organize this um, into an actual device? Um, one very key concept in Fiber Channel is the FC node. The FC node contains um, all the um, specific components that we just went through to define a fiber channel port and interface. The, uh, um, of course, the layers lowest level, lo level would be the PN port, which um, covers the FC0 to FC2P layers. Then you have a multiplexer, which um, allows for distribution of frames. And then you have the uh, um, port layer or VN port, which handles the uh, frame, the uh, control of the frames and, and definition of ports. And above that, you, you have the FC3 and the FC4, um, the UOPs. So the relations between some of these components, um, the, the term V node is inter interchangeable with the term node. A V node is many times used if you have multiple um, nodes within the platform. And the platform is the actual um, component that holds um, a set of nodes. And a platform could be a si system, um, a host system, or it could be a storage device. Um, the term VN port is interchangeable with uh, NX port, N port, NL port, and, other, and, and, and others, depending on the topology and the configuration. So a little bit of a summary here. The, a node is administratively defined, administratively defined group of um, NX ports in the in, in UOPs, associated UOPs that exist within a physical entity, um, such as a platform. Um, the, uh, um, each node has its own unique name identifier, which is um, worldwide unique, um, which allows it to be ad addressed um, by some of the control functions and management functions, such as name server and management server. And with that, I'll pass it on to Patty. Thanks, Craig. Um, so let's delve a little bit into the physical model of Fiber Channel. Um, the protocol and the interface are are really designed to provide a reliable, scalable, high throughput and low latency interconnect. And it's especially well suited for connecting servers to shared storage devices, um, but also for connecting storage controllers to their drives. Um, this picture shows um, a, the most simplistic view <clears throat> of a fiber channel environment. Uh, as you can see in the picture, with fiber channel, there are at least two PN ports, and each of them are associated with a platform, platform A and B in this picture, and they're connected by a pair of fibers. One fiber in the pair is used to transmit traffic from one PN port to the other. That's the bottom fiber in this picture. And hence, traffic on that fiber is also received by the peer PN port. And the second fiber, the one on the top in this picture, is used to receive traffic on the first PN port, and hence the peer uses uh, that same fiber to transmit traffic. 
This pair of fibers is what we refer to as a link, and that's what's used for data communication between the two PN ports. Broadening that concept out a little bit, what fiber channel um, attached visual, physical equipment is comprised of is one or more platforms, and each platform contains one or more PN ports, and each PN port contains a transmitter and a receiver. That fiber channel link that you see there is inherently capable of simultaneous bi-directional flow. Um, from the perspective of a given PN port, for instance, PN port A1 or B1 in the picture, its transmitter sends the data frames out on the outbound fiber and its receiver receives the responses on the inbound fiber. Um, but fiber channel provides very flexible mechanisms so that uh, simultaneous data transfers can happen in parallel. Now the hardware inside the PN port that manages the transmission and reception of data at each end of the link is what we call an LCF, a link control facility. And in an endpoint or a node, the LCF is called the PN port. Inside a fabric entity, that same LCF is called a PF port. So easy to remember, PN, N for node, PF, F for fabric. Next slide. Okay, a PN port does not, of course, act alone. Um, as, as Craig described, it receives the request from an upper level protocol to transmit the data frames. And you can see that in platform A, transmitting data frames in this picture. Uh, in response to having sent data frames, it must also be capable of receiving link control responses for those frames, uh, which could be things like an acknowledge frame. And that's half of what a PN port does. But if you look at the PN port in platform B, it depicts the other half, right? Um, if PN port A can send data frames and link control responses, then obviously a PN port must also be capable of receiving data, data frames and sending link control responses. Now, there are three different communication models in which a PN port may operate. The first is simplex, and simplex operation is defined as a PN port transferring data frames in one direction only with link contro control frames flowing in the opposite direction. Below that, you see full duplex operation depicted, and that's defined as a PN port that's simultaneously transmitting and receiving data frames with link control frames also flowing in both directions. And that leaves the last one, which is half duplex operation on the right side of the chart, which is a PN port that is capable of both transmitting and receiving data, but not simultaneously. So both data and link control frames can flow in both directions, but the flow is limited to a single direction at a time. So we've already touched a little bit on um, the various interconnect topologies inside of Fiber Channel. Um, and the interconnect topology is defined based on the capability and the presence or absence of a fabric between the PN ports. Um, we already talked about what the three, named the three basic topology types, point-to-point, -point fabric, and arbitrated loop, and we'll go into them in a little bit more detail in the next few charts here. The protocols in Fiber Channel are topology in independent, but certain attributes of that topology can restrict operation to one of those communication models that I previously described. So the first interconnect topology is point-to-point. -point. And a point-to-point -point topology is sometimes also called direct connect. And it allows communication between PN ports without the use of a fabric. So it's a topology, as you see depicted here, in which exactly two and PN ports or devices are connected to each other. The frames transmitted have only one possible receiver, no routing involved only one place for it to go. And the bandwidth, obviously, between these two PN ports is also dedicated to the two PN ports. Then we come into a fabric topology. 
And a fiber channel fabric is a switched fabric topology that provides an underlying in infrastructure that allows you to interconnect multiple, uh, maybe even thousands of nodes to create um, often a storage area network for the term span. So that generally is a, a fabric topology. And in the fabric topology, the fabric uses um, something called the destination ID that's embedded in the fiber channel frame header to route the frames through the fabric, and the fabric can be one or more switches, um, to the desired PN port. Now, one thing that I always find interesting to note in a fiber channel switched uh, fabric is that the fabric will route the frames to the specified destination ID, even if the destination ID is the same as the source ID. So, in other words, something called hairpin turns are supported in a fiber channel fabric without any special switch configuration needed. If the switch receives a frame with the same uh, destination and source, it just sends it back to the source. Um, in addition to providing the internet cap capability, um, the fiber channel switches also provide various fiber channel services, which Craig has alluded to and Dave will talk about a little bit more. Um, the fiber channel director class suite is also provide certain advanced features, things like zoning uh, to block unwanted traffic and encryption. The last uh, interconnect topology is arbitrated loop. Um, and this is a ring topology that enables you to connect a set of nodes in a one-way loop. Uh, the maximum number of ports that you can have in an FCAL uh, topology is 127. However, as you see in the picture on the right, one of the ports in the loop may connect into a fiber channel fabric um, switch port. Uh, the bandwidth inside that loop is shared among all of the ports, and only two ports uh, can communicate at a time on the loop. Uh, fiber channel ports capable of arbitrated loop communication are called NL ports when they're on a node, and FL ports when they are part of a fabric, and collectively we just call them L ports. The, the uh, arbitrated loop on the right where you see no fabric port, there are only NL ports that are a part of it, that's called a private loop. And the arbitrated loop fabric on the right with, a fab, with an FL port is referred to as a public loop. Now, historically, FCAL was a lower cost alternative um, to a fabric topology due to the cost of switches. But for quite some time now, um, as was mentioned, the use of FCAL is actually very rare, especially in server-to-storage communication. So then we can move on and talk about classes of service. Uh, Fiber Channels defines three different classes of service, and which is used is based on the level of integrity that the application requires. Um, Fiber Channel offers service classes known as Class 2, Class 3, and Class F. The classes of service are topology independent. Uh, if a fabric is not present, the class of service provided is really just a special point-to-point -point, uh, case. And fiber channel ports are not required to support all classes of service. Which classes they do choose to support is indicated um, to their peer as part of the initialization process when they connect to a fabric and when they connect to another endpoint. So we'll delve a little bit deeper here into what each of the classes of service provides. Class two is a frame delivery service that multiplexes frames at frame boundaries, but importantly, with frame acknowledgement. Um, class two service is requested by an NX port on a frame by frame basis. Craig talked about delimiters, right, being special ordered sets, and, and that's where um, it's indicated that you're requesting class two for this particular frame. Um, the transmitter transmits class two data frames in a sequential order within a given sequence, but while the frames are transmitted in order, the fabric doesn't guarantee the order of delivery and the frames could be received out of order. So there's something called a sequence count field within each frame 
that's incremented by one for each frame transferred and can be used as a receiving end to reassemble that order. Um, the fabric or the destination and export guarantees notification of delivery in the absence of link errors. Now, why do we say here in the absence of link errors that they would be an exception to the rule? Because in the case of link errors, the source ID may not be error free. So there's no guarantee that we can know who to notify of the delivery failure. But in the absence of link errors, so in the good case, the destination uh, and export provides an acknowledgement, generally via an act, to the source for each valid data frame received. However, the, the data frame may not be successfully received. It could have been busied or rejected by the destination and export. And so there are port busy and port reject responses that would be sent back. If the fabric's unable to deliver the act, then it would um, could also reply back with uh, F busy or F reject. So that's class two. Class three is a frame delivery service with fabric multiplexing frames at frame boundaries, but in this case, it's without frame acknowledgement. Um, class three supports only unacknowledged delivery where the destination port doesn't send any kind of confirmation back of link control frames when it receives a valid data frame. Uh, the fabric, if there is one, uh, and the destination port are both allowed to discard class three frames without any notification back to the port that transmitted them. Um, you can do some things in a higher level protocol uh, to know, you know, to provide some sort of acknowledgement, but that's all above the fiber channel standards layer. And similar to class two, the class three service is requested on a frame by frame basis. Um, and again, we have the same thing where the, the transmitter will send the class three data frames in sequential order within a sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, did we lose the slides? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the transmitter will send them in a sequential order, but again, sequence, you know, there's no guarantee in a fabric that they will be delivered in exact order and the sequence count can be used for reassembling uh, the frames. The fabric will make a best effort to deliver the frame. So even though it's unacknowledged, um, it is a, a best effort to deliver them. But if it's unable to, for some reason, it's not going to respond with a busy or a reject to the source and export so that it knows that the frame was not delivered. And the last class of service is called F for fabric. And it's really um, a connectionless server that's very similar to class two that I described with the acknowledgement, but it's used exclusively by the fabric for internal control and coordination and configuration of the fabric. So it does provide for that notification of non-delivery between the switch interconnect ports via like an F busy or an F reject kind of response. And similar to class two and class three, it's requested by an interconnect port on a frame by frame basis. So that's my last slide. And I think I turn it over to Dave at this part to talk a little bit more about the fabric model. Yep, uh, thank you, Patty. And uh, the fabric model is near and dear to me. Uh, the primary function of the fabric is to receive frames from a source port and route those frames to a destination port by using the address identifier that is specified in the frame header, as we mentioned, that's the DID. So each end port is physically attached to the fabric via a link, and the FC2 level specifies the protocol that's used between the fabric and the attached port. You should note that the fabric is characterized by a single address space, and this means that every end port has a unique end port identifier. And uh, the fabric also specifies the classes of service it supports in its uh, fabric login service parameters. And moving on, the fabric model. The model is conceptual, and I note it may provide the following major functions. There's no requirements, but typically these are the major functions that are needed. So we got a bi-directional physical fabric 
port, which we mentioned, which is the PF port. We got a receive buffer, then we got a frame delivery service, then we got receive buffer queue management. And this slide is an illustration of uh, just a sample example of a fabric model components. So picking one way over on the top left, we got a PF port with its transmitter, and it's got the receiver with the associated receive buffer and uh, any receive queue elements associated with that. And all these PF ports are attached to the frame delivery service, and uh, which has a fabric control services associated with that. Uh, just a sample, uh, again, there's two or more PF ports and it's all implementation specific. All right, and the fabric model, more on fabric ports, which FX ports. The fabric, as we mentioned, the fabric model contains two or more of these ports with each port attached to one or more end ports at one or more physical end ports, again, through a link. And as we mentioned, each FX port is bidirectional and supports one or more of those common communication models that we mentioned and the frames are routed to the, the appropriate FX port attached to the destination end port and the receiving FX port responds to sending to the sending and exports according to the FC level protocol and also note the fabric may verify the validity of the frame as it passes through the fabric there's no requirement uh, more on fabric ports. So each fabric port may contain receive buffers, as we mentioned, for the incoming frames. And note the maximum data field size that the fabric is able to handle for these frames to determine during the login, where one of the fabric service parameters indicates the maximum data field size for the whole fabric. And again, the, the duty of the fabric is to route the frames to the FX port attached to that destination and exports based on the value in the DID field that is embedded in the frame adder. And these routing mechanisms within the fabric are uh, transparent to the end exports. Basically, we have a, a summary of two different methods of routing. We have a, like end-to-end -end device based routing. Then uh, we also had the, the adoption and inclusion of exchange based routing. Uh, recently. So diff two different routing mechanisms, but again, they're transparent to the NX port. All right, so on the fabric model frame delivery service, again, it multiplexes frames at the frame boundaries, and uh, the frame delivery service does not guarantee full length bandwidth usage between communicating NX ports, and the fabric notifies the transmitting NX port with a reason code embedded in a link response frame if it is unable to deliver a class two frame. That's only specific to class two. Then for class three, as we mentioned, the fabric does not notify the transmitting and export if it's unable to deliver the frame. And a little more on frame delivery service. Uh, frames from multiple and exports are targeted for the same destination port in class two or three, then congestion may occur within the fabric. And uh, we have a recent work lately uh, to deal with congestion management that you might be interested in. Take a look at that. I think we'll be talking about that down the road too. But anyways, the management of this congestion is part of the frame delivery service and uh, it's a buffer buffer flow control. And if every, if any buffer flow to buffer to buffer flow control error occurs, then the fabric logs the error and may discard that overflow, overflow frame without a notification. And uh, that error logging is vendor specific. All right, so that brings us into generic services. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Craig and uh, Patty mentioned that uh, FC3 stuff. So here's uh, the highlights that we got here. We got the directory service. Again, we mentioned the name server. Then we also have the uh, virtual entity identification server. Then on the management service side, we got a slew of servers here, fabric configuration server and the enhanced fabric configuration server. We got the unzone name server, and then we got the fabric zone server, as Patty mentioned, and the security stuff. And uh, we got a fabric device management interface that's tied with the HPAs. And then we also have an application server. The other one is event service. Uh, 
I'm not aware of many people using the event service these days. And lastly, on the generic services, each of these services is addressed with an end port ID for the NX port providing the service. So these are actually uh, deemed NX ports in our realm. And uh, the, the well-known addresses are recognized and routed to and by the fabric and the services may be centralized or distributed. I believe that's all we got. And I'll hand it back over to Mr. Rogers. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is, uh, as is typical of this, these presentations, we seem to touch on more that we want to drill into. And there's just, uh, just a lot of things that we can uh, expound upon. Um, First of all, we, we will have a sequel or a part two of the uh, Inside the Fiber Channel Architecture coming up on the 27th of October. So for those of you who are visiting with us today, um, be sure to sign up and register. We'll have some more good information about this. One of the things you, you said you, you, you teased us, Mr. Peterson, um, FC congestion management. I know we've been talking about this. How, how, did, how did that come about? What's the theory behind that for us? Oh, boy. Uh, well, it has to do, uh, uh, what do they call it? Loss of credit devices. Uh, Patty, what is the term that we coined that? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but... Uh, because we had, you know, the credit loss stuff, and we, we we've had this really robust methodology of ensuring we could have these communications in the fiber channel fabric. And I'm trying to, I, and I can't recall off the top of my head, why we, why we did the F, why the congestion management came about from that. And I know it's, you know, between uh, fiber channel and ethernet, they seem to share a lot of um, ideas, if not technology, backplane technology in some instances, but um you know, the, the, the overall goal is just to you know, deal with congestion management in the fabric. So, you know, inform the, the end devices that if congestion is occurring, then uh, uh, the end devices can uh, appropriately do the, the right action is the overall goal. But the, the intent is, yeah, just, you know, credit starved devices, those types of things. To deal right. with what kind of a methodology? Go ahead, Patty. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, I was just gonna say, I think the goal is to give the end port visibility to what's going on in these fabrics, which can be fairly massive, right? And every end port can't see what's going on on every single link in the fabric. So the fabric um, has awareness of where there's a slow drain or, you know, where there's a congestion or some sort of problem, maybe a link integrity kind of event happening. And it can notify the interested end ports so that they can take appropriate behavior to try to relieve the situation. In other words, you know, if if uh, there's congestion on one link, maybe I, I have multi-pathing capability um, in my upper level protocol and I can route frames for some period of time to the other paths instead of the one that's having a problem. Um, and yeah, so it's really that. It's really to give awareness to the end port so that they can potentially take action with that awareness in mind. Yeah, slow drain is the, the, the key word I was uh. that we're using for this stuff. So, and uh, yeah, slow drain devices in fabric are, are very painful to deal with. And that's the driving factor with this. I know we can get congestion at switches or, you know, con uh, conjunction points, if you will, in fabrics. I was just, you know, the, the credit exchange and how we do buffer to buffer credit seems so robust. It would, th this just kind of adds adds a little bit more uh, intelligence to that, you think, or shares? I mean, because I, I don't know what credits that you have or what buffer buffer exchange you have. Is that where we're going to share that information so we're a little bit more intelligent? Well, uh, no, we're not going to that level. Uh, you do have the, you do have your counters for credits, correct? So, but but the credit is between two points on a link, right? right. And so, in a in a fabric, 
I don't have visibility that that link over there that I'm trying to talk to an end port at the end of is starved for credit. Correct. Right. And so by being told that there's some sort of congestion event over there, again, if I have the ability in my upper level protocol to deal with that fact and route, uh, you know, do my traffic differently, I, I can take advantage of that. Correct. Yeah, we'll be, uh, so we we'll be doing uh, some more deep dives on congestion management for those people interested. And in, uh, we spend a lot of a lot of work on this recently and uh, i think it's really good work yeah we certainly have i thought i thought you know as you brought it up it just tickled me that you know we've been talking about this we've been working about you know the work groups and uh for those of you who are not behind the scenes with those of us at the uh, t11 meetings the same group of people spends an awful lot of time discussing the ins and outs on these and making these things seamless for the implementation groups and the integrators out there that are putting together these fiber channel solutions but the, the whole uh, concept of, I, I recall we had a thing called predictive failure analysis for hard drives uh, that we were talking about a few years ago in the storage industry, where the drive could give you information that says, I might be having some problems. So you could get a, a head start on that. And I think that kind of technology and thoughtfulness that we put into these specifications is really beneficial for everybody. I mean, otherwise, why would we do it? We wouldn't do it just for an exercise in futility, but um i <laughs> do uh do any of you guys have some uh let's see where we, i'm not even at the closing slides here do we have any um oh look, i should probably read this and then i'll ask for any final other thoughts but uh please rate this event uh, if you're watching this we do want your feedback we do want to know what of what is of interest to you so we can produce more quality events and get more information into your hands uh, we will post a Q&A blog and, and more of this information will be available on our fiberchannel.org website. And of course, the link is here on our, on, if you take a look at that. Um, the list, I'm not going to read this to you, but you can see we, we've done a, quite a few things in the way of webcasts and we've got a lot of archival information in there. Uh, one of the favorite ones are the... Uh, the acronym ones that were uh, Mr. Barry Maskus takes us through what some of the things are that we talk about. Um, but please, you know, visit, visit our site and get some more information. And, um, so before I, before I wrap it up, do you have final thoughts, Craig, that, you know, any, anything uh, that you've thought about that, uh, we should probably drop on the audience, whether that be a, a nugget for future consideration or a summary of today? Um, well, you know, I think, I think the, uh, it's important if people are, um, wondering what, what, what's next fiber channel and what we're doing about some of the issues that we brought up this talk is you know talking about congestion location to uh tune into the next talk um, we're going to be diving into some more of the higher level stuff that we're, we've been working on and which exists in fiber channel um and you know to go along with that i think part of the discussion that we we're having earlier there's actually two layers of of issues that can cause congestion there's loss of credit on the on the link so if you have the Power channel credit mechanism is just link to link. And if you lose some of the credit on that, um, you can also start slowing down and, 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 and having a slow drain. And that solution has been around for a long time. We've had a solution in, in the power channel standard to recover lost credit um, on a specific link for a long time. The congestion of vacation stuff is a, is a newer effort to do it more on a fabric wide um, basis when, you know, you, when, you know, instead of, how things used to be, you know, you had something running slow and you had to play detective and figure out what was going on. Now the fabric has the ability to play detective along with you and, and give you information. And in some cases it can, it may be able to solve itself. In other cases, it, it'll give you pointers to, you know, what you can do um, to, maybe, to maybe, or or these pointers to where the problem may, may lie. Um, I do see that we actually have a, a question that came in from the audience here. Yeah, I saw that too. So to the to the wider audience or to the wider the panel, uh, the question that popped in was what determines if class two or class three is used and what do the storage devices typically use? So typically, I would say that that's a decision that's made in the device driver um, of the host that's you know sending the traffic. Um, 
more than not class three is what is what's used uh, and you allow you know we don't need notification of every single frame that went by that that is an inhibitor to bandwidth um, but there are certain types of frames um, they may be ones defined in the upper level protocol they may be um, certain link control um, operations link services in fiber channel that uh, the device driver is using that are special and and are often desired to be sent in class two so there i say use of class two is selective um, based on the upper level protocol and the particular link service being used most everything is sent in class three yes okay. well, most things. of your most of your class your, your scuzzy or nvme traffic um at least the bulk traffic is sent in class three and the reason the reason for that is that the upper layers um, have their own error recovery mechanism instead of relying on on an end to end uh, flow control, which can sometimes cause its own con congestion. Um, and in particular, FCNVME now has has a new uh, sequence level error recovery mechanism, which um, re allows for very fast recovery. And that mechanism is also being introduced into the, into the SCSI um, um, uh, implementations as well. Thank you, guys. Um, David, you got any final words to to share? Uh, final thoughts? There's a second question, Dave. Oh, yeah, it looks like we got another one. <laughs> How relevant? Th I'm glad these are coming in. How relevant is Fiber Channel in the NVMe implementation? Fiber Channel is, is just the uh, the the roadway, if you will, for the NVMe. NVMe is designed to be somewhat transport autonomous at this yeah. point between PCI, Ethernet, and fiber channel. Um, yeah. And of course, the fiber channels, the, the work groups have put together FC, NVMe uh, enhancements to make certain that it's a uh, it's you know optimized as best it can be across that and of course fiber channel being the preeminent storage fabric you would expect that right but um any other thoughts from the panel on that well yeah the uh the uh, fc nvme fc nvme and nvme2 defines the fc4 for nvme so there's nothing really specific in the nvme implementation fiber channel uh, we're just we're just another transport But I would, I would and arguably, yeah, I was just going to echo what, what you had said, Dave, about fiber channel being the premier storage transport. So I think there are a lot of uh, constructs in fiber channel that uh, make it actually a great transport for NVMe. Yep. Yeah, we can seamlessly run uh, FCP and NVMe traffic. Well, that you can run it. You know, we can run multiple different types of storage traffic simultaneously. But um, yep. yeah, I, I think the, the beauty—the beauty of NVMe or even any of the other transport agnostic protocols—are that we're we're not doing protocol conversion on the fly to try and encapsulate the the information in a new uh, in a new. I use the roadway and the car model a lot with when I explain things, especially to my folks. Um, you know. The roadways, whether they're dirt roads or gravel roads or nice paved asphalt roads are going to be there. And what we're trying to do is create a, a compartment or a passenger vehicle that really doesn't have to worry about what the surface of the road is. It could just float above it, if you will. And that's the beauty of some of the things like NVMe is, um, you know, we we don't have to worry. The roadway has to worry about maybe handling that, that package, but the package doesn't have to worry so much about the roadway. Yeah. Yeah, NVMe is just another ULP from our Yes, our exactly. Level. Do we have any more questions from the field? We're getting close to uh, 10 to go. So we, we have a couple more minutes, but uh, um, I, I asked this and uh, David, did you, did you have any more you know summary thoughts that you'd like to share or are you just done speaking for the day? Oh, never, never done speaking, but uh, so <laughs> it, uh, Craig mentioned, uh, yeah, stay tuned uh, if you want to learn more on the congestion notifications and management. And uh, appears that there's a lot of interest in that. And we'll have some more information in the, the next part two on that and do a further deep dive on what we presented today. 
Okay, I'll give you a, a, one last note here that came in. Um, nice to hear about class two, class three, class F. It will be nice to see examples of frame types. Uh, what is an R already, R underscore already, an already, that's what I call them, considered to be what are the standard fabric services, DID address numbers, examples of what FDMI looks like. So we've got it. We've got a uh, uh, an outline for one of our next webinars here, folks. So um, yeah, this is this is exactly what we're going to deep dive into in the next one. So this is good information. That's perfect. And 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 just just just, just some quick answers. And and already I mentioned that that's considered to be, to be one of the ordered sets, the special character sets. It's a very low level um, signal. Um, and um, I think if people also um, want a, just a primer, we have some older uh, webinars, which should still be available on the website, which do have uh, FC, FC primers that go just into the very basics, um, probably more basic, uh, just a, more of a baseline than what we might have presented today and in, in, in the next talk. Um, and if you go to that link on there, you can go back and look at some of those, those older, older webcasts. I can't encourage the audience enough to look at the resources and what we have archived on the website. To your point, Craig, it there is, you know, there, there's been decades of information that have been categorized and catalog, uh, captured and cataloged on that website. So, yes, if, if you have some other interesting questions or some, you're new to Fiber Channel and you want to get some more details, please, please, please. Go hit that FC uh, fiberchannel.org website and look at the webcasts, look at some of the blog posts, um, and you're going to get some really good information. And if you have other questions, you know, send them into your your fiber channel, the people you know, or, uh, or you know, send them into the. I don't know if we have a contact. You know, we have a contact page on the FCI website. Yeah, so you know, send in, uh, become part of the uh, the web, uh, part of our team, and um, send us your questions. So. Hey, with that, I'm going to call it a call the ball here. And uh, David, Patty, Craig, thank you so much for participating with us today. And we look forward to our next event coming up on the 27th of October, part two of this uh, of this series. So thanks, folks. And we'll look to see you on the web or elsewhere. Bye bye.